Hello friends, Jerry Rosa here at the Rosa Stringworks Workshop. We've got a real nice uh, fiddle neck repair for you that's going to come up here in a few minutes. But first I just wanted to take a couple of minutes and talk to you one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Uh, it's been a while since I've done anything like that. Uh, hopefully this won't turn into a rant, <laughs> although there might be a little bit of a rant at the very end. And of course if you don't want to listen to any of this, you can always fast forward and go right to the work. Um, but first thing I just want to say is uh, I appreciate each and every one of you watching the videos and all the really nice compliments I get. I, I get, uh, you know, I, I want to say 10 to 1, but it's more like 99 to 1 uh, favorable compliments as opposed to negatives. So I'm very lucky there and I appreciate that. We have hit 1,600 subscribers and on our way to 1,700. And uh, again, thank you for doing for subscribing. And uh, I might just mention real quick uh, on the subscribing uh, part of that, there is a way you can get email notification. Now, this might vary depending on your uh, viewing platform, but on my tablet, you know, it, it tells you whether you're subscribed or not right here. And there's a bell next to it. And if you click on that bell, it will uh, put little things around the bell indicating that you're going to get email notifications. So anyway, it's, that's how you do it. You just, you, and there's no cost, obviously. So if you want to be notified when I put videos out, then just go to that subscribed area and then push that little bell and then you'll get a notification each time. Now that's how it looks on the tablet. It might look different on your platform. So I wanted to uh, just take a minute and uh, read a few, uh, and I've got qu quite a few here, but they're short. Um, I want to read quite a few of these little compliments and things that have been coming in. Then I've got one that's not quite so complimentary, and uh, I'll read that one too, and that's where we might get on a little bit of a rant. Most of these I think are referring to the most recent video, the broken back on the Gibson where we inlaid the pick and it said thanks. These are just random. When they have a name, I'll read the first name. When they have a username, I'm not going to give out the username because it will just give it away. This one just says, wow, I so love your videos. I love the silent way you did this one with the, your music. Incredible. Uh, not to say that I don't like them with narration. I love them all. So that's really nice to hear. Um, it, it makes doing these videos kind of worth it because perfectly honest with you, these videos take 10 times more time than you would believe. If the video is an hour in length, it for sure takes me six to eight hours to make that video and probably a lot more than that. Um, and I don't even spend the time on them that a lot of my buddies do. There's a guy, my, my buddy uh, that has the Redneck Restorations channel, uh, Jeff uh, Bradshaw, he spends more time than I do. And, and it's obvious in his editing, you, you can tell that. Um, this one says, nothing short of fantastic. You are the best. The more I see of what you can do, I am amazed. I thank you for that one. Again, that was a username that uh, I can't really give out. Uh, this one, uh, even though it's a full name, I'm going to go ahead and give it because he's a YouTube personality. Uh, he plays banjo for the Oak Ridge Boys. His name is Todd Taylor. And uh, anyway, he said, you made me smile on this one. Jerry, love you, buddy. Awesome again. So that's nice to hear from someone who uh, that uh, he says he watches my videos as he's going down the highway in the tour bus. <laughs> I think that's pretty cool. Uh, this one, I'll just give you the first name. His name is Chip. It says, great video, uh, very informative. P.S. My wife <laughs> thanks you also. After purchasing your Mandolin Method uh, DVD, my playing has improved. Coming from her, that's great. <laughs> he says, laugh out loud. And he's going to keep me posted as to his progress. It, uh, I didn't get part of the time with these YouTube comments. Uh, they don't all print out here, and I'd have to actually go search out each one of them, get the rest of the comment, and I'm not going to do that. Just reading what I can see on the printout. This one's from Mark. It says, I watch all your videos, or try to, and this one was very well presented. I love the music, the speed up effect, etc. Well done. Uh, this one's from an actual customer that uh, sent me an email, and uh, I don't have the note, the name on this one. To yeah, I do too. It's Dave. Um, got the mandolin back safely today. Great work. I, it plays like a dream. You are right about the increased volume and the highs and the mids. Would definitely recommend you to anyone looking for a really great setup. I will send you a review on the instructional DVD after a while. 
after he evaluates it. And it says, keep up the great work and the great YouTube stuff. Uh, here's one from Sam, says, hey Jerry, what would you think about drilling out those uh, jagged holes in the peg head to make them true circles? And he's referring to that, uh, what I call the Tennessee Stradivari violin repair. And I thought this one was worth mentioning. You know, I get lots of suggestions and ideas, and those are fine too. I, anything that's constructive, I'm happy to hear it. Uh, I mean, even if it's negative, I'm happy to hear it if it's a constructive thing. But uh, anyway, uh, Sam you know, was talking about why not just use round dowel pins and put them in those holes. That would be a little less destructive, I guess you'd say. Well, and he's got a point. And I have done it many times that way over the last 33 years. But what I found about that is there's a couple things that don't work very well. Um, the dowels, you're putting them in on end grain. So the end grain is poking back out. So when you dye that, it never it absorbs the dye really fast, so they get real dark circles around the holes, which isn't always real good. You, it, it really brings it out where you see that really well. Another thing is, and more importantly, is that uh, they don't the pegs don't hold as well when you got the end grain going in like that. So you know you got to drill a hole in that end grain, and then you have to ream it out to fit the shape of your violin peg. Well. You know, the problem with that is when you start reaming it, that end grain tears out and it never makes a nice smooth hole. So if you used a plug cutter, and I don't have a plug cutter, but if you had a plug cutter and you cut plugs and put those in the hole, that would be awesome. That would work real good and the grain would match up better and, and it would work good. But uh, I find that uh, on this one specifically, and I probably would do a plug cutter on, on a smaller repair problem, but this particular repair problem had all those extra holes drilled around in the corners. So I could take a square plug, put it in there and get rid of those little holes too. And um, you'll see in the next video, and that'll be the next video I'm going to be putting out, I believe, that the that really did blend in good. And uh, once I stained it and everything, I mean, it didn't look very good in the patch, I have to admit. In the raw, the patch stuck out like a sore thumb. But after I stained it, it barely even noticed it. So, uh, and after you get the peg in there to block the view of it, uh, I think it's gonna be very, uh, very little noticeability. So anyway, that's why I did the square thing rather than the round dowel. And, uh, but you know, I appreciate the suggestions. Uh, this one's from Graham, it says, I thought I would write you something. Uh, I should have got the rest of this comment because this was a really, really nice one. But uh, he says, I would write you something. This is the first video of yours that I have seen after watching hours of other Luthier videos on YouTube. You're a great guy and you really stick out compared. And then it, it, that's the end of the comment. But um, it went on to just be very, very complimentary. And I really appreciate that. Okay, well, here's the one that really wasn't very complimentary. <laughs> I got a separate email from a, a, a gentleman, and I'm not going to give out any names on this. And the email just said that, uh, you know, I'd like to know the price of your violin or of your mandolins, your custom mandolins. So, you know, I sent him back a, a preliminary, you know, that they, they start out at six thousand dollars and go up from there. And you know, I don't mind telling you that they're six thousand dollars. And some people immediately will say, "Well, you're just greedy." Well, that's exactly what he said. He said, uh, "Well, that eliminates myself, and I'm sure a lot of other people. You should really check your greed status." Well, okay, uh, I, you know, everybody's got an opinion, and you've got your opinion, and I, I can appreciate that. But, um, you know, if you know anything about high-end instruments, and that's what I'm building, I'm not building the bottom end, I'm not building a Kmart or a Walmart mandolin here. Um, I'm building as good as I can build, and I think they're as good as anybody's on the planet. And I really mean that. I'm not, you know, I hate to brag on my own stuff, but I believe they're as good as anybody's that are being built today. So, if at $6,000 I need to check my greed status, well then I would say, you know, companies like Gibson and or Gilchrist, uh, who's not really a company, he's an individual, but, uh, you know, I think they need to check theirs because theirs is at least three times what mine cost. You know, two to three times anyway, for sure. So, here's how that breaks down. You know, yeah, $6,000 does sound like a lot, and it even sounds like a lot to me. But when you think about it, I'm using the absolute highest quality materials. The boards themselves, I probably have about 300 bucks just in wood. 
you know, you got a case that's going to be 175 bucks. You got, you know, strings and accessories and, and all the metal parts. The tuning keys alone cost $520. The tailpiece is over $100. I'm like $160, I think now. So, you know, it just goes on and on and on. When you add that all up, and I've got about $1,400 in expenses. That's just out of pocket. So that, you, that comes down to 4,600 clear. And that's clear if you don't consider things like, you know, the, the air conditioning in the shop here, you know, and the, all the other overhead that you have. So it's 4,600 bucks is what I'm making. And I figure it takes me about 125 hours to build one. And that's a rough estimate. It could be a little less, but I have a feeling it's more rather than less. And so when you break it down to 125 hours, that's only $36.80 an hour. Now, that's a lot more money than you make at McDonald's, but on the other hand, that ain't, that's not just ripping people off these days. I mean, uh, at least in, in what I'm doing here, it, you know, for, the, for the money, you're getting something that's as creative as I can possibly be. Uh, each and every one of them is unique to a certain degree. And they're artistic. They've got carving in the back, you know, and all that extra inlay that I put in them. And uh, so, you know, I'm sorry if it offends anybody that they're $6,000, but that's what they are. And that price will probably be going up rather than down. So uh, if anybody is interested in one of them, maybe now's the time to get interested because they, the price could be going up fairly soon. All right, I'm sorry about that rant, but I just needed to, to get that off my chest and just get that said. I hope you enjoy the rest of this uh, video. I think I mentioned it in the video that uh, this was the one that was left in the hot car. So uh, you'll see what happens when, when you leave one in a hot car, it, it's going to have to be fixed. Enjoy the video. Thank you for watching. As you can see, this fiddle has got an extraordinarily low bridge. You can tell that it has uh, come loose here. And the reason was it was in a hot car. I did a little public service announcement video and showed this fiddle in that video. Now we're going to fix it. I've already taken the strings off of it, so this popped right off. That was no problem at all. Now we need to get the neck out of the joint. The problem is with hide glue, it heats up like that and comes loose, but then it re-glues itself back down. So now it's glued back in there at the wrong place. And so it's a little bit difficult to get it out of there. I'm just trying to wiggle it and see if it'll break, crack loose. Sometimes they will when they're like this, and I'm just kind of wiggling it back and forth and hoping that it'll do something. Unfortunately, it doesn't feel like it's going to. So, we'll get out the hot knife and see if we can't uh, persuade it to uh, let go. I've got the torch heating up over there burning and I'm just heating the end of this blade. This is a very, very, very flimsy, thin blade. And uh, I'm just going to see if I can work it down in this joint a little bit. See if I can work it underneath here. Yeah, don't really need to there. It's already loose all the way back. See if I can make any progress there. It's it's looser, but it's not loose. Right in the very center, I can't get the blade down in there. I can get it on both sides, but right in the center, it doesn't want to go in there. Well, it came out, it didn't come out perfectly clean, but... Once again, I'm not going to use hide glue, and I know that's going to offend a lot of people, and I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. I uh, really don't like hide glue a lot, uh, especially on the heating thing. You know, if you put it together right, you don't need to take the joint apart. That's what I say. Okay. 
So, gluing her all up real good. I have to repair a little bit of damage right around the edge of the neck where when it broke it loose it cracked some of the spruce off of there and it's just and that had already been repaired before so it's easier just to put in new pieces rather than try to fix the old pieces that had already been fixed so well as you can see we the glue joint turned out nice you can see that it matches up there you really can't even feel it it feels good um, the angle I've checked the angle here and it was a little low so what and this was actually a little heavy anyway so what I did was I put it on the flat belt sander and sanded it with more pressure here to this point here so that I created a slight taper to raise the tail end of this up a little bit more that gives me an almost 7 8 inch high uh, uh, area here which is about what I like little more than three-quarter the three-quarter is just a little low in my opinion your bridge has to be too low so about seven eighths is pretty close and anyway we're just about ready to glue it glue the fretboard back on but uh, before I do that I'm going to clean, clean off the old glue here I'm going to show you a trick I use whenever I'm gluing a fretboard onto a fiddle I also use it on other instruments too I take a little tiny drill bit that's actually small, just a little bit smaller than a na than a tiny nail, and it's a both of them are tiny, and um, I just drill a little bit of a hole, not very deep, a little over an eighth of an inch deep. I take the nail, which will basically push in the hole now, and I just take the hammer and just I put my hand under it to support it, and then just tap it a little bit till I can feel it solid, not very much pressure at all. Then I take my nippers and I basically nip it off flush, but nipping it off flush leaves a jagged little point there. And you'll see what I use that for here in a minute. I'm going to do the same thing up here, although I'm not even going to go as deep, just a little ways, just a little ways in there. Again, put my finger hand under it to support it, tap it in can tell it's solid then I'm just going to nip it off leaves a little tiny nib there then I very carefully position my fretboard the where exactly where I want it take a little rubber mallet and go right over the top of that where that nail is and tap it and make sure I'm still good tap it here rubber mallet and then if you look on the back side if you look carefully you'll see two little tiny marks where that where those nails are hitting Then I take the drill and I just barely make a little dimple right there you gotta be careful you don't want to drill through it obviously Okay, and now that's a good locate. Those pins will locate it, and they literally will stick in that hole. And when I glue this down tight, it won't move. It, you know, like the clamps. Whenever you glue it down and then you clamp it, they all this thing just keeps sliding back and forth. But if you do it this with this method, it won't move at all. Okay, it's time to get her glued up. Those little nibs on there, I don't have to worry about it moving on me. Just like always, want to get 100% glue coverage. Once you get her clamped up, then you again, you always want to wipe off that extra glue. Um, you can scrape it off later, but then you could also be creating more problems for yourself. So it's just about as easy to wipe it off now. 
except that it is a little hard to get in there where the clamps are. I'd have been better off if I put one clamp on one side and the other two on the other side, but I didn't do that, so. The other thing that's very important to do is once you get her clamped up and glued, you look down the fretboard to make sure you look down it to make sure it's lined up down the center of your instrument. This one looks really good. So it's about as good as it gets. And you make sure that you're still flush on both sides. Everything's good. On the fiddle, we've got the neck glued back on it. We've got the fretboard glued back on it at the proper angle. Um, I cleaned it up along here real nice so that it feels real smooth. Um, I'm trying to put a new tail pin in it. The tail pin that was in there was not ebony and it was wallered, the hole was wallered out and the pin was pulled up at an angle. I started fitting this new pin in there and I was wiggling it around to try to see some wear marks on it and I got it stuck. <laughs> see if we can pop it out that way. There we go. I've already reamed the hole out to make it fit better and this pin is a little oversized and uh, what I do is I turn the pin like that as I'm pushing it in and it'll make shiny marks on this ebony and wherever it's shiny I just need to get rid of that. And Each time you do that it goes in a little bit further. It's about a little more than a sixteenth from going all the way now. When I started it had at least a quarter of an inch to go, so I improved it back quite a bit there, about three sixteenths. Yep, that's it right there. It just needs just a little bit of a tap. Take the rubber mallet and just give it a little bit of a tap and it's it's in it's in there. It's not going anywhere now. Guarantee you you can't pull that out of there. Now the uh, the little tail nut here is got glue all over it. It's come out too, so we'll Clean the glue off and put it back in there. Got a little squeeze out under the chin rest there, wouldn't you know? So, oh, it's never simple. Got my little chin rest wrench here, tool, and loosen it up and take the chin rest off and get it out of my way so I can do a better job here. There's no cork on the bottom side of this either so I think I'll put some clean it up and put some felt on the bottom of that but that'll be for tomorrow. I'm done about an all I want to do today. Okay, I'm going to carve these little pieces off a little bit that I've filled in here. I 
I think I've already said it, but I just want to let you know that these pieces had been filled in once before, and uh, the, the reason I know that is because they went past the purfling here, and uh, they filled into that joint that when, when those pieces broke out of there, they had no purfling on them, so I know they were filled in once before. Now we'll take some dye and dye it in there and a little bit of finish. These leather dyes, they let themselves blend in. Uh, to the surroundings, it's, it really works well. Except for the fact that the purfling is missing, it's hard to tell now. It's pretty hard to see it actually. It's, I mean, you can see it, but it's not that bad. And what I'm gonna do now is put a little bit of linseed oil on that area, which will help it a little bit too. I'm actually going to spread the linseed oil out a little bit because these edges are dried out and cracked anyway and that will also help it blend in where you won't hardly see it. The linseed oil is good all the way around here because this is really dried out and cracked out and this will get rid of that drying and cracking area. That looks pretty good. It's not perfect, but uh, you know it was it was repaired before. So, like I said, you can't uh, can't always fix it perfect with other people's hands in the mix. I'm going to uh, touch this spot up here a little bit too. That's just from where the tailpiece is drug on there a couple times. Looks much better. It's not great, but it's much better. Okay, I believe this baby is ready to put back in service. So we'll string her up and bring you back in just a minute. Okay, we're going to string her all up. Um, I just point out uh, for those of you doing your own work and stuff on these uh, adjustable tail pieces. Some of them are built in, and some of them are added on like this one. Um, when you see these are adjusted up pretty far, the best thing to do when you're restringing or even just sometimes just tuning, you just lift these, bring these all the way back up, get everything set up with these all the way in the, so that these are in the, if you want to call it the down position, and uh, that way it gives you a lot more adjustment when you know so you tune it up with your main pegs as close as you can get it and then you do your fine adjustment with these but that will give you plenty of adjustment now okay I'm going to take a little bit more time and I'm going to try to uh, straighten these strings up up here in the peg head so that they look good I'm not going to do my full setup on this. Uh, that wasn't my charge. My charge is just to repair the instrument. And so we've got it repaired. If I was doing a full setup, I would change this bridge. Because I'm not crazy about this particular bridge, but you know, it is what it is. It's it's, it's usable, but it 
I would just do it different. I'd cut it a little bit wider where these strings are a little bit wider. Okay, we've got her sitting there kind of precariously at the moment. It's just sitting there kind of loose. The sound post is in there. I'm going to check the string length. I generally set them at about 325 millimeters. So there's 32.5, that's 325, right on the money, right where it's at. The sound post, in my opinion, is probably a hair back. It's back about here. Well, it's about here. And it probably could be up just an eighth of an inch, but on the other hand, that's not too bad. It's I'd rather see them a little further back than right underneath it. They get harsh when you put it right underneath them. We'll go ahead and put the uh, chin rest back on it now. Well, actually, I'm going to put, I said I was going to put some felt on there, so we'll do that first. I put a little bit of uh, stick on felt on there so that uh, it will uh, protect the other side. It had kind of scratched it up a little bit. This top side has cork on it already. You can see over the years where people that have been tightening this up have scratched it here and stuff. I always am very careful about that because it just leaves, you don't hardly have to touch the finish on an old violin to scratch it, especially with anything metal. Got it nice and snug. You don't have to go cranking on those and get them real tight. There's a very, very, very minor little crack right in here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and glue that up. Just a little tiny, you can just see where there's a little tiny separation there and it does move when you squeeze on it, so might as well fix that while we get her apart. Okay, we got her relatively tuned up. I'm just double checking the length. It looks like that's right got the bridge standing up as straight as I can get it. It's a little bit uh, on the thin side, but it'll work. I tuned every string about 20 cents sharp, and the reason for that is because I know from experience they're going to stretch. Uh, after you take a fiddle apart, this string stretch quite a bit. Pretty much any instrument, that, that's true. But it's in uh, pretty good shape now. I don't expect them to have any further pro problems with it. We repaired a few other things that uh, they weren't expecting, like we fixed this end pin, put a new one in there, a better one. Um, obviously, we got the uh, the uh, neck back in there, and we got the uh, neck angle really nice. As a matter of fact, it, it's just about perfect with the bridge that was on there. And uh, we got her strung back up. We checked the string length for intonation, and that should be just about right. And we got her tuned up. So let's just see how she sounds. And uh, keep in mind, I'm not a fiddle player. I just play one on YouTube and only on my channel. See it's already down to, that's a straight G, that's a little bit high, I'll go up to 10 cents on the G now. Like I said, I'm not a fiddle player, but uh, I can play it enough to know that it sounds real nice. It's a good sounding fiddle, and uh, it's set up pretty well. I uh, wouldn't do too much to change it. I'd probably spread this out just a little bit, 
I probably cut the uh, bridge just a little bit more on the on the treble side not much but just a hair and uh, otherwise it's just about the way I would do it hope you enjoyed it thank you for watching